Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and in this week's episode, we are discussing torture and the ethics surrounding it. Uh, but before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Isolation L. And this is from the Odell Brewing Company in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, what a great name for a uh, for a podcast on torture to, to be drinking Isolation L. Yes. Uh, yes. Th- this is going to be this is going to be interesting. Although we actually um, almost subjected ourselves to a little bit of sadomasochism. Um, <laughs> Not <laughs> cause Thursday. We because we can't call it torture, and we'll discuss that in a little more depth here in a little bit. But um, so we almost subjected ourselves to a little bit of sadomasochism in the spirit of this torture episode. Um, we were in the store looking for a beer for this episode and turned around to find the giant display of Bud Light behind us. Oh, God. <laughs> w- wouldn't it apply? It would have been appropriate. That, 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 that would have been appropriate. And the show would have ended right there. But um, we can't condone torture. I can we? Con- I can't condone torture. Do we know? Uh, I, maybe by the end of the episode, uh, I'll change my mind. Uh, but um, I don't know. We'll have to look at it and see. <laughs> we'll have to look uh, at it. Okay. The, the deontologist says, says says we can't do it. Uh, the utilitarian, maybe I don't know. So, what what is a uh, what does torture mean to you? I'm I'm a little curious. It's kind of a, a a layman's understanding here of what is, what is torture. In your opinion, a layman. Well, I've read two different definitions: a philosophical one and a dictionary one. So I'm going to try and take myself out of that. Um, ignoring the the two definitions I've read, which I thought were great, um, using pain of some sort, whether psychological or physical, to uh, manipulate behavior. Okay, I think that's a fair definition. Yeah, that, that's essentially what I would go with. It is kind of difficult once you've done some research on it to to get back to that. But yeah, I would say um, inflicting inflicting pain or suffering on somebody um, to get what you want out of them. Okay, uh, so, so so the the use of of the use of pain force. Uh, uh, on, on a person or a person's family members, perhaps, to, to, to get something done, right? Yeah, I would think of it in the context of um, either ex- uh, causing these sorts of things for revenge or for information gathering. Yeah, okay. You know, I, the I, things I'll, that we kind of saw after 9-11. Yeah, and, I, and I'm glad you, glad you brought that up because that's kind of where I want to start this because, uh, you know, if you grew up in a time period, if you came of age in a time period before 9-11, um, I think that Americans would say that, that, that torture is something that Americans do not do. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can distinctly remember being, uh, be, being, being taught that torture is something that banana republics do. Torture is something that, that the North Vietnamese did or, or Stalin and his gulag did. Right. It is something that Americans do not do. Uh, but but we know today that, that that's that's simply not true. Right. Um, no, no, we still don't. We do enhanced interrogation. I, am. <laughs> I guess we'll get into those differences actually, too. Actually, the, uh, the, the CIA uh, has, has come out, and, and, and while they like that term, enhanced interrogation, they have now come out and said, uh, uh, no, no, th- th- there's torture being done, and there, mm-hmm. it's being done at Gitmo. It's being done at... at, at uh, 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 Al Garib, the, uh, um, the the prisoner of war camp in Afghan. We know it's been done. We've seen pictures of it. But the argument that they make, uh, and this comes from a New York Times article, says that uh, that this doesn't violate American anti-torture statutes. There aren't. There is no restriction against doing that, uh, so long as there as, as two factors are met. It's not done in the continental United States and it's not done to American citizens. Yeah. Uh, what do y'all think about that argument without, without, you know, without going into any detail, just gut instinct. I think torture is torture. Yeah. I mean, I think it's torture. Uh, if you're asking me the, the question about how does it apply to American law? I'm really not familiar enough with the laws pertaining to torture to answer that question. Yeah. I, I think I would, I would feel 
Like they are, are probably being honest about whether or not it's it's legal. Um, so I would say they're probably right there. Um, but it's still torture. Okay, well, let, let's look at this because uh, torture is illegal in the United States constitutionally. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Eighth Amendment is, is where we find this. Where the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution states, excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed. And this is the important part. Nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. I think that, that, that in a pure reading of that, that clearly says that the use of torture is unconstitutional. <clears throat> well, a question in my mind that, that arises from that, and again, we're talking about legal questions, not ethical ones, right? Because I think ethical I, questions... I, I think I want to start off with, with, with legality. Yeah. Uh, when, when it talks about cruel and unusual punishment, I tend to think of punishment as a <clears throat> deterrent to behavior after the fact. You did something, we're going to do this bad thing to deter this behavior yeah, in society. Consequences of... Being convicted of a crime. Yeah. But when you talk about a lot of what's happening in Gitmo, it, it's more to the point of you actively have information. And so to that point, we're... Or you're suspected of having information. We're going to extract that information from you using this punishment. But you can make it stop any time. And it's very much the, the same argument of somebody being held in contempt. Maybe they haven't been convicted of a crime. But the, the court has ordered something of them or requested something of them. And as soon as they're ready to comply, they can go free. But until then, they're held in contempt. Okay. Is that, is, is that your understanding of this as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it, 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 is, it is not mine, as, I, as I've read all this. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, I moved a little bit as I did this. Because I look at this, and, and again, it says very specifically, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And I can't imagine much more cruel or unusual than, than waterboarding or right. or, or, or uh, uh, the denial of food that's been done. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's there. But here's the here's the issue you run into is is CIA clearly said that this doesn't apply in those cases. That this is not uh, again, it's not American citizens, and their argument is the Constitution applies to American citizens. And the second argument is it doesn't happen in the United States. It happens in time of war, and in time of war there are different rules. Um, I understand that. And, I didn't and, and, realize we were at war. Well, yeah, we are at war. We're, we, 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 well, are we at war? Good, good point. Good point. We're not at, not at war. We're, we are in a, um, what are not, they calling it? Military conflict, military conflict, police engagement. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, but, but the argument here is in a military engagement, I guess we're still at war with Korea so we can torture Koreans. Uh, but, uh, okay. but, but, but here, here, here's what, here's what kind of changed my mind is I was reading a constitutional scholars argument about this and he came back, uh, and, and, and he said that that's not understanding this because the framers, the framers came through and they put some clear exceptions in the constitution. They, they listed them yeah, and they went out of their way to do them in a certain places, such as, um, the third, the third amendment has this quote in there. We talk about the, about, about quartering of troops mm -hmm. it says uh it says in times, in times of war of, yeah. it specifically says in times of war uh the fifth amendment when they talk about, about about your rights under the fifth amendment it says except in cases arising in the land or naval forces of the militia with an actual service in time of war or in public danger the eighth amendment doesn't have any, any stipulation like that it yeah. doesn't put those those restrictions right and the argument here is if the founders believed there were there were cases where, where where torture would be okay, they would have that they would have put that in here just as they did in, in in the third and the fifth. Yeah, well, and and the the thing I would argue to them for the two arguments they made, I, I made a a different argument, <clears throat> but for the two arguments they made about things are different in time of war, and that um it uh, the Constitution only applies to Americans. My response to them is, if you if that's your stance, you need to show me. In the Constitution, or in a higher document, one where the Constitution says the Constitution only applies to Americans, and two, where it says it's an, and it, you can say things are different in times of war. Now, the difference may be in times of war, you fly a purple flag instead of a, a red, white, and blue one. It doesn't matter. But saying things are different doesn't inherently give you a right to all differences. It doesn't give you a right to 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 
chop up babies into little pieces or something, right? So to say things are different doesn't then justify the difference you've set forward. You have to say things are different and this is different and this is different because X. And yeah, just, there, this difference exists and this is how it changes this aspect. Right. Well, here's how the Supreme Court dealt with that because uh, I, I agree with you. The Supreme Court heard these cases and, and they found the same problems that legal scholar had. But they looked at it and they said, you're correct. Had the, had the founders wanted to make exceptions, they would have outlined it clearly. Yeah. But they found an end around, mm -hmm. a, 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 as, as often happens. Uh, but by taking a broad ruling on the Eighth Amendment, they said that the Eighth Amendment has no bearing outside of criminal law, that it's there dealing specifically with criminal law. Uh, the quote here is that the Eighth Amendment, this is the quote, was designed to protect those convicted of crimes. This is in the Supreme Court case in England versus Wainwright back in 1977. And that's more the argument that that was articulated earlier. Yeah. yeah their argument here is that, 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 yes, all these rights are there, but these rights are specific to the criminal cases. And uh, if torture is being used on an international scale to deal with a global war on terrorism, then it's a different situation. What do you, what do you think about that? To me, that's a logical uh, loophole. That's a, that's a leap that they've made there. I would have to question why it is not okay to inflict cruel or unusual punishment on someone convicted of a crime, but it is okay to inflict cruel or unusual punishment, a.k.a. torture, on people who have not been convicted of a crime. Well, and I think that's a good point. And I think it's, right now, you know, we have more show to do, but I think it's not okay to do it. But the pertinent question to me is, does the Constitution, what is the Constitution, that we're talking about now, yeah. what does the Constitution say on it? And, and honestly, I tend to side with the court that when you talk about you know, needing to get information about a, a plot to kill a bunch of people. I don't think the Constitution really speaks to that, you know. It doesn't speak to how we conduct things in a time of war. But in many instances. But that's the whole argument here is that it does specifically speak to those cases in other amendments. So the logical step would be if they if they took that step and said, you know, with quartering your troops, we're going to deal with times of war. With uh, your right to privacy, we're going to deal with times of war. But they they went out of their way not to do that with this amendment. I agree. I agree. And what I'm saying is, and maybe we can look up the definition here. Uh, this doesn't fall to me under the definition of punishment, depending on how they're using it. If they're just using it because they're angry and they want to stop jihadists, now we're getting into punishment. If they're using it in the specific circumstance of you have information, we need you to divulge it, that to me doesn't fall under punishment. And so that's where I say this doesn't speak to that. Now, is it wrong? I, I, I tend to think so. Is it effective? I tend to think not. There are other issues here, but I don't think this is punishment. Well, something that occurred to me while this conversation has been going on is I, I think you could find a way to apply punishment here. Um, you asked them, where's the bomb? They said, I'm not going to tell you. You inflicted the punishment of them or the punishment of waterboarding. We'll use that again or shocking their genitals. Um, said, all right, I will stop this when you comply with the request that I've made, until then you're going to be subject to this punishment. And I think that's the key. They have the ability, if this is done in an interrogative manner, to stop it whenever they want by divulging the information. I've pulled up the definition here, punishment. The infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was trying to get to while I was, I was going through this, is to me... Uh, this is not punishment because you've not been convicted of a crime. It's, you're not being punished. For, it, it, it's, um, uh, I don't know, pre-punishment, I guess. We're going we're, we're, we're gonna to do this before an action is done. And, and I, I, I don't know what kind the of word a, is. It's a, it's a tit for tat. It, it's an exchange, right? So we can look at another term. We, we've talked about waterboarding, which gets to your comfort, your safety, you know, multiple things. But we can talk about it in other things, right? If, if you sit there... And I have some money or I have a piece of equipment, right? 
and you steal my equipment, and I have the only farm in town. I need that equipment for my farming. And and I say, where's my equipment? You steal my equipment, and you say, I'm not telling you. You you you. I don't like that you have the only farm in town. You say, okay, fine. I have the only means of food. You aren't getting another scrap of food from this farm until I know where my equipment is, right? Or somebody's grounded. You have a kid. You have a kid who's done something. You know they've done it, and you need some information from them. You say, you're grounded until you tell me. To me, it's not punishment if the, if the receiver of the punishment has the means to end the punishment at any time through cooperation. It is an, a, 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 a bargaining measure. Now, we can a- yeah. ask what bargaining measures should and shouldn't be allowed, but it's, it's not, not... You're not arguing justness or unjustness. You're arguing vocabulary at this point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can agree with that. I can agree. I don't, I don't think punishment is the right word. I don't know what the right word is. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're doing an action and giving a way out. The way out might not be much better than the action. Yeah. Um, but, but you got something there. Uh, what I find interesting is, you know, we have three branches of government. And I've already outlined here where the executive branch has agreed. They have said clearly uh, th- through the CIA director, that's part of the executive branch, mm-hmm. that torture is okay. The judicial branch, branch seems to have agreed that torture is okay. It's our legislative branch that seems to have the difficulty with this. Uh, and and there's, been a, there's been a big struggle. We oftentimes forget about it's this. It's too, too few. Yeah, we oftentimes forget about this, but the legislative branch has tried time and again to, to limit the use of, of enhanced interrogation techniques and torture. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2003, they, they, they passed a law against it. It's, it's, it's technically illegal. Uh, so so how, do you, how do you get around that? Well, the argument that was made, and it's an argument I've made before, is that the Constitution, you can, you can make any changes you want to the Constitution because the Constitution is not the governing body of our military. The Uniform Code of Military Justice is the governing body of our military, and the, the, the restrictions aren't placed there by the, the Congress doesn't place the restrictions in the, in the UCMJ. So you've got something that's, that's kind of bizarre there. Well, and, and you know, this, this kind of speaks to me about, about the, the deep ways in which our system has become broken in multiple ways. The fact that Congress has tried to do X and failed, Congress, this should not be a problem for Congress. This should be a very kind of, you know, a, a, a procedural minor thing. If Congress does want to do it now, if if there's like a majority of Congress doesn't, but some minority kind of sneaks them into a bill, yeah, you know, we're talking about different situations. But if Congress really wants to do something, it should be no hassle, an easy thing for them to do, minus constitutional amendments. Well, in 2008, I said 2003. I, I've yeah. got it here in front of me. Congress attempted to limit torture, and what they did is they passed a law. Congress passed a law saying that the CIA was limited only to the de- detention and interrogation procedures listed in the U.S. Army Field Manual. So uh, and that, 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 that's, a, that's a pretty restricted idea. Yeah. Well, so my question- you're telling us what you're going to th- – th- this is the list of what you can do, and we're limiting you to that. It passes both houses, uh, and both uh, the House and the Senate. It was House Resolution 2080. Successfully passed, but it was narrowly passed. Mm-hmm. Was then vetoed by Pre- then President Bush, and they did not have the votes to override it. Okay, mm-hmm. well, and, and I mean that's 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 fair, whether I like it or not, it's fair. It, that we is, had a system that yeah. it didn't make it through for whatever reason. Yeah. So I, I thought what you were saying is they passed it, and then they they did some wordsmithing and said, "Oh, not it," you yeah. know. And and to me, that's a much bigger well, problem. Okay, but there's this other issue too of uh, of, <coughs> of of international law. And right. I think we could do a whole show on international law, and I'd like to do it at some point. But we are signatories of the Geneva Convention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hell, we ran the Geneva Convention. Now, tell me about the Geneva Convention. Was that did that come to a treaty or an agreement? The, the Geneva Convention was was uh, was drafted by the United Nations, led by the by the United States, and then it was sent back, and and it had to be uh, approved by 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 treaty by the Senate, and our our Senate approved it. We are signatories to it, so, approved by the So Senate. it is a treaty. So it, it holds higher power than the Constitution itself. It does. And here's the problem is the Geneva Convention doesn't have any, any room for argument about this idea of the Constitution uh, not having an application. Uh, it says here, uh, 
Whoever, whether inside or outside the United States, commits a war crime in any other circumstances is, is described in subsection B. That's where, the, where, where we talk about this. Shall be fined for imprisoned or imprisoned for life or terms of years of death uh, or, or any term of years or both and even death. So according to the document that we signed, uh, life imprisonment, a number of years imprisonment or death is the punishment. Or fine. For, yeah, yeah. That's that that's that's the punishment for it. And to me, that clearly says this is illegal. Torture is so not something that's what allowed. What does it say about torture? Because I want to get to that. What are we not allowed to do, or do, or is that? Well, what they did is they they that they say commits a war crime. The thing is that 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 they define uh a, a define torture as a war crime, and I'll find that definition here here in just a second. Uh, go ahead. So by that, we have or people in the United States by order of their superiors have committed the war crime of torture and yes according to the Geneva Convention should be locked up that's right uh, and uh, are not uh, uh, under under a, a pure understanding of the law yes they should be they should be locked up for for that action. And, and you know the really sad part here is on, on this whole conversation recently one one got free but got freed because they finished their sentence but whistleblowers who have said you're doing this have gone mm -hmm. to jail instead of the people who doing are doing it. it. Yeah. Here's the Geneva Convention's definition of torture. Uh, the act of a person who commits or conspires or attempts to commit an act specifically uh, intended to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering uh, on another person. Yeah, I, I think that's clear. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, and, and that's straight from the Geneva <laughs> Convention. So you look at that and, and, and you... You know, it seems like we're, you know, we're we're going in circles trying to figure this out, and we have contradicting laws. Right. We have domestic laws, and we have uh, have, have, have uh, international laws there. But we also have a, a hierarchy set up. We do, but 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 it, if that's not even understood, does international law trump national law? Treaties we've signed are understood. I mean, it's clear in the Constitution that treaties trump the Constitution. Whether that should be the case or not, I mean, it's 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 fairly black and white. Okay, so do you do you how about this argument that uh, um, that uh, my brain's not working that torture is extra constitutional? I guess that goes out the window because of the Geneva Convention, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's not in the Constitution. It's somewhere else that's higher but, than yeah. the Constitution. Now, now we've gone through, we've gone to a lot of trouble to try and fix this over the last years. Now we were back, we, we, we were looking at, 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 at you know, uh, right after nine eleven, we were much more accepted. Anybody remember the event that that happened that that, that kind of woke America up to torture? Uh, I remember the pictures. The pictures, Abu Ghraib. Yes. Yeah, uh, the Abu Ghraib pictures. If I don't know if y'all remembered or not, was it, wasn't I, that like Chelsea it. Manning? No, no, uh -uh. no, 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 no. Okay. But there was a picture of a uh, of, of a U.S. military. Uh, it was I, I, the pile of naked people. Yes, and and they had they had taken these these uh, uh, prisoners prisoners and stripped their clothes off, and they were piled up, and they had a lady standing on top of them doing this this pose like 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 she'd conquered them yeah. in her military uniform, and she sent this to, to a friend, and it got out, and the next thing you know, we 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 find out that. That these actions are going, uh, and 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 that that was not an isolated incident. That was not an isolated. That was a way of breaking them down, mm -hmm. uh, and and it was it, to insult them to to have them naked in front of a female, uh, and it was insulting <coughs> to the religion. It was a way to to to, to, to do it. Degrade think, them. Other yeah. things they did is they 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 uh, they made them pee on the Quran. They uh, there was a lot of stuff that was going on. V very reminiscent of of the uh, the French tactic of of dipping bullets in pig blood in pig fat. Yeah, 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 very, very, very similar to it. Uh, uh, or uh, they would sit down and have dinner. Uh, you know, sit down with them, have, have have a U.S. Army, a female soldier, eating with them, and then afterwards say that, that, that they're menstruating. And, and if you were very serious about it, this was a this was a this made you unclean to be to be be there with them. Yeah, stuff like this was going on. Um, so you look at this and you realize that after that we start we, we start uh, limiting this. And we passed federal anti-torture statutes back in, uh, what year was this? This is in uh, 1994. This is even before this. Uh, this is, if you want to look it up, it's Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 113C of the U.S. Code. 
This law prescribes harsh punishments for anyone, whether they are an American citizen or not, who commits an act of torture outside of the United States. A person found guilty of committing torture faces up to 20 years in prison or death if the torture resulted in a victim's death. This was added in 1994. Uh, this is a year after the United Nations adopted this same law in 1984. Mm -hmm. So we look at this, and, and, and it's not something that, that, that that's new. Uh, we, by the way, also have something called the Torture Victims Protection Act, which allow victims of torture, the family of victims of, of torture, or families of anyone killed through <laughs> extrajudicial means to sue their torturers in U.S. courts, whether they were, uh, uh, whether they're U.S. citizens, and regardless of what it happens. I, I, I am I remembering incorrectly? I thought I remembered. Oh, yeah, I am. I was going to say I thought I remembered some families coming forward to sue. Um, for torture, but it was something else that they were suing they for. They have, it, but this law allows the families to sue, uh, not just Americans. You can, yeah. you can bring, uh, under this law, you can bring uh, foreign people up on, 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 on trial, and we can, theor in, theor in theory at least, we mm -hmm. could go get them, bring them back, make them stay in trial here in this country. Well, haven't we done very, that? We have, not in a long time, uh, but it's very much like the Nuremberg trials post-World mm -hmm. War II, uh, you know, where we rounded Nazi up the, uh, and all the Nazis. That. Or uh, Mossad hunting down the uh, the Nazis in in Argentina, way well up in the 1980s. Right. This kind of thing was happening uh, happening all, all the time. I want to talk about what the the, the, the things that, that that the U.S. government's done as torture, and uh, this is this is actually from the Central Intelligence Agency. A report from them said uh, that CIA detention practices include, and this is a quote, mock drownings medical rapes, slamming heads against the walls, forcing prisoners to stand on broken bones, placing living prisoners in coffins, threatening the murder and rape of the, uh, of the, uh, the family member, and sadistic games of Russian roulette. Wow. This is from the CIA saying this yeah. is what we've done. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, I'm going to tell you, um, in preparation for this episode... And 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 I, I didn't even realize I was gonna be there whenever I started this. But uh, I watched a, a video on like the top ten most gruesome, gruesome torture methods. Now a lot of these were 1700s, yeah, 1600s, very very medieval. At the height of torture. Yeah, yeah. Um, Witch hunts. Yeah, I uh, halfway through the video, I was actually sitting outside on the front porch smoking. It's it's kind of chilly. We're in Texas, so anyone up north is going to think I'm just bitching for no reason. But uh, just below seventy, we, we bitch. Oh yeah, but I was out there and, right, and it was so. cold, and it was sitting out there. And all of a sudden, I stopped the video and I sat there and I I, I was not in a fetal position, but kind of had my my arms in that position was was rocking a little bit. And she kind of turned to me. She goes, "Are you okay?" I said. No, I'm, I'm getting cold sweats and I, I'm getting nausea. I feel like I'm going to vomit. And I had to like go lay down just from hearing some of this stuff. And, and you know, I, I feel even kind of like um, unmacho or whatever from that. Just because there are people that had to endure this stuff. And I'm just sitting here, you know. Hearing about it. Yeah. 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 But just hearing about some of this stuff, is it, it, was, it was physically... It had an effect I was not expecting. I had to stop the video part way through. I did force myself to go finish that. I said, you know, I'm at least going to do the, the the service of finishing this video. But it it it's one of those things. It's 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 easy to sit here and hear like, oh, well, they played sadistic game of Russian roulette. What is medical rape? First of all, what the hell is that even? I don't know, and I tried to find it out. I don't yeah. I don't know what that what that is. But but that that's terrifying. Yeah, but but doing all this stuff, it's it's fine to hear it in, in these very sterile, I'm going to say, yeah. terms. But when you start hearing the details of it and what these people are going through, and not just what they're going through, I think it's really easy. Mike, in a previous episode, it's it's probably behind the paywall right now. We were talking about is waterboarding torture, yeah, yeah. And, and you were kind of saying you didn't think it is because um, you had to go through yeah, it as a marine. That we do to our, yeah. our, I've argued before that it's something we do to our servicemen. If we do it to our people, it's not torture. And and one of the things that I found in the definitions I looked up, uh, in, in, and I was looking at the uh, Stanford Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a fantastic resource, Great resource. Has, has four different papers on torture. But I was I was reading through it. 
And one of the things they were talking about was you, you can't be a willing participant in it. And, you know, that's one of the things. When you're a willing participant, you know maybe days ahead of time, okay, Thursday's waterboarding day. Yep, yep. And then we're going to go through waterboarding, and waterboarding's going to end, and then I'm going to go back to my life. When you've been doing this for a year, and you don't know if you're going to die tomorrow, and yep. you, you, you ask for death, or it's going to be another 10 years of life that you have to endure this. That's a different Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And, 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 and you know... Whenever I was reading this as studying this and, and, and looking at, at the way it affected people, my opinion moved a lot on that. Yeah. I still don't know where I am in some of this because we're going to get in the philosophical arguments. Right. And I, all this stuff that I've read to you so far, it, I, I was reading this and it completely changed my mind. Screw this. Torture is never good. Then I got into the deep philosophical side and I went, okay. Maybe I, maybe I move back where I was a little bit. I don't I don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a tough issue for me. Uh, the next section I want to get into is the philosophical argument. It's kind of a shift here. So do we want to talk about this beer before we make that shift? I think so because sure. I'm I'm most way through. And uh, you know, can I start? Sure, guys. This is an excellent beer. I uh, for having that that wit beer last week, and I I was kind of like expecting something great, and let down. This is. This totally makes up for it. Um, Isolation Ale by Odell Brewing Company. Do we know the ABV on this? No. Mm. It's got a. It's got that winter flavor. It it and and I say that winter flavor. It, a lot of winter beers try and spice. This is not necessarily spiced so heavily. It's it's a little bit sweet. It's a very smooth transition. There's a little bit of bitter on the back end, but it's not overly hopped. Not overly bitter. Um, I'm really having a trouble pinning the flavor of it. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe someone else can can help me out. But I can tell you, without being able to pin this flavor, mm, it, 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 it it's an excellent beer. It's it's smooth and it, it hits all the right points. I know I'm not giving a great description here. Uh, I am though going to give it a three three. Three three. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's a 6% ABV, 6%. by the way. 6%. You yeah. or me? You. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go as high as you did. Uh, yeah. I like it. I think it's a good beer. I like the flavor of it. Uh, it's in that spot that I have a problem with where I like my beer to be very light and very easy to drink, or I want it to be be, be thick and, 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 hearty. Uh, and, and hearty. And to me, this has the flavor of a, of, of a thick beer, but it's, it's just too thin for that to me. I want, I and want I think it. there's an audience for that. I think there is, but it's but it's but it's not me. Right. As I love the way it tastes, I think it, it, it's going to get a good rating, but I wish it was a little thicker. I think there's a little more body to it. Um, I will say the flavor profile. It's not a bell curve like we've had before. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes up and stays with you. It's, yeah. It, it doesn't have that. It doesn't have that drop off. And I kind of like that. I, I I like a flavor profile that that comes in uh, slowly, then kind of shocks you, and then kind of slides back off. This kind of stays in that shock place to me. Um, so it's I almost just, like it keeps you there and you kind of get used to it. Yeah, and, and, and it's a good flavor, so I don't think it's something to hit for. It's just mm -hmm. not what I'm looking for. It just, I read it, I read what they said, and when I drank it, I could taste it. So maybe it's psychosomatic, maybe not. That sweet on the front end that goes into that hoppy yeah, finish, yeah. caramel. Okay, I can, I can see that. I yeah. can see that. Uh, if it was caramel, I, I really would expect it to be a little creamier than it is. But uh, yeah. so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit it for for being too thin. Okay. Uh, but but I, but I'm gonna give it a good flavor. Uh, I'm gonna go a little lower than you. I'm gonna go two nine on this one. Okay, yeah, that's where I was gonna go, and where I'm still gonna go. Um, I like it. I, I think you actually described this one really well. Um, it it does have a, a really rich flavor for as uh, light, nearly empty of a mouthfeel as it has yeah um it it's almost like you're drinking two different beers there's the beer that you feel in your mouth and there's the beer that you taste it's drastically different but it is still really good and i almost find it and this is why it does reach up to 2.9 for me i almost kind of like that it is so flavorful and it has such a nice wintry flavor without being quite so heavy. 
Okay. Um, so and two nine from you. Yes. Two nine from me. And what was yours, John? Three three. Three three. three, three. So, so about a three one. That's pretty pretty respectable. Beer. Yeah, it is. Pretty respectable beer. Uh, go ahead and try this. So, let, so round robin, real quick. Uh, the the three questions. Uh, lawnmower. This is gonna be a hard one for you. I think. Uh, no, I don't think it's hard for me at all. This is not a lawnmower beer. What this is? This is the beer I want to drink as soon as I finish mowing the lawn. Uh, yeah. b- because it, you know, I, I, I think it's a little <laughs> too much while I'm mowing the lawn. But when I'm done, this is this this is good. Not a lawnmower beer. A nice settle down. Yeah, a nice from settle the... down afterwards. Not a lawnmower beer. Uh, Our producer almost spilled all over everything over there. You better it, not spill. It tried to run over. Yeah. Oh Sorry. Wow. Anyway, that's why anyway, my eyes got so big. If you were watching so, the video. So the question for this is which date? I don't want to put this in terms of like first date, second date, third date. I want to say that first time you go out together and get like a winter cabin. Now, I think there's a few other beers you could incorporate into that. Or maybe you go on a winter camp out or maybe you just sit by the fire for Christmas. This is a great... I think it's a good campfire fire. Yeah. Beer. Yeah. So buy a fire cold, buy a warm fire, whatever that is, whether that's a date, whether that's a marriage, this is the beer for that. Be a good hot tub beer on a cold day too. Oh, oh yeah. 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 It would that. Um... I don't think it. This beer gets you laid by itself. Um, I think. Oh fuck yeah! I don't know what she's talking about. Well, that's <laughs> true. Um, you only have to bring the beer if you want to sleep th- with me. That's that's I, also I, true. I, I require the beer. <laughs> he requires a beer. Yeah. But no, um, I don't think it does by itself. If you're going out to try something a little off the beaten path, um, and you hit on this one, I I think it is a marking your in your column um i think if you were bringing this beer to the show you were probably getting laid anyway i was suspecting. Hmm. okay so, pr- so pretty good pretty good beer there uh, this is a beer of somebody with some game is what i'm saying oh they, yeah, yeah they were yeah. getting yeah. laid anyway yeah. beer drinker beer i think so yeah i think, I think so, so. Yeah. i think so too uh be a good introduction to the to, to, to uh to heavier beer too i think yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a good it's transitional a good, beer yeah, transition, real good transitional that's what i was gonna beer. use yeah yeah all right, so let's talk about philosophy a little bit, and I want to come in from consequentialism. Uh, if, if you if you've had our, heard any of our shows, and they're probably behind the paywall now on on consequentialism. So if you want to go catch those out, uh, have we done one on consequentialism? Well, utilitarianism is type oh, of consequentialism. Right, okay, yeah. Uh, you'd have to look. You, you got to, You got to join Patreon to see those more than likely now. But consequentialism is is the belief that all of your uh, decisions should be based on the consequences they lead to, okay? Yeah. The particular Ooh. school of consequentialism that I want to talk about is utilitarianism. Yeah. And that's that everything is measured against its utility. Uh, so uh, against its its uh, its usefulness to you or its, its, its ultimate value. So you measure one value against another. And uh, the, the definition here is that utilitarianism is a moral philosophy based on to what extent an action promotes pain or pleasure. So if it promotes the good, it's inherently good. If it promotes the bad, it's inherently bad. Really quick, I don't, I don't yeah. want to chase a, a, a too far down a rabbit hole here on, on uh, uh, utilitarianism versus uh, uh, deontology. But <clears throat> I find it really fascinating how, how much the two are, are interlocked because... I've made arguments in the past, and you can go listen to old shows and, and hear them, on why a deontological worldview cannot work um, in, in a practical life because there's a certain amount of measurement that has to happen, and that gets back to utilitarianism. For our, our audience <clears throat> listeners that don't know, deontology is the belief that, that you act from duty. Yes. Well, you have, you have certain rules, and you follow those rules no matter what. I think yeah. a more layman's approach. But – I love here how this definition exacts that utilitarianism requires a certain amount of deontology because when you talk about value systems and and weighing value of whether it's pain or pleasure or whatever it is, life and death, you have to have a deontological value system set up where you say, well, the most important thing in the world is pleasure or the most important thing in the world is life or whatever it is in order for a utilitarian system to work. So I love how, how, and and both sides are going to hate it. But how symbiotic those two That's systems true. are to each other. And, yeah. and, and to such an extent that, that, that utilitarianism is going to have to 
again divide, divide itself into act utilitarianism mm-hmm. and rule utilitarianism. Because they have two deontological because views. They have two different deontological <laughs> yeah. positions. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting to me. So let's talk about act utilitarianism yeah. here. And I wanna, want you to kind of kind of think about this. Um, again, act utilitarianism is the belief that as long as the benefits of something outweigh its cost, it's, it, it's, it's justifiable. So it's a, it's, a, it's a morality calculus is what I like yeah. to think about. So if you are an act utilitarian and you said uh, that I'm going to violate the rights of one suspected terrorist, but in the end, I'm going to save a thousand lives, the act utilitarian would say that, that, that one is clearly less than a thousand. Therefore, uh, you would support the use of torture in this case as philosophically acceptable. Yeah, it's the torture uh, problem as opposed to the tr- trolley problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so an act utilitarian would always look for the best option compared to all other alternatives. So, if you're an act utilitarian, is it acceptable? Uh, if, 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 if that's your belief, and, and I think there's a, a a great degree of logic to that. If you're a fan of, uh, uh, I've forgotten what the show was that was so big a few years ago with Jack Bauer that was out there, but uh, Mad Men. No, no, no. no. If every episode he went out and, and stopped a terroristic attack, but but, but mm, it, he all. It. 60 Minutes. Something like what? that. I forget. That wasn't 60 Minutes. That was a news show. No, no, it was something uh, like uh, that. Uh, Listen to us. It was, it was the we're most, bad at TV. It was the most popular we're... show in the world for like two years. No, no, no. But, but the, the premise was, no, the it premise all happened was in, in real time. each hour was an hour and a day. Yeah. 24. And 24. 24. 24. Yep. Right. 60 Minutes. I 60 love it. Minutes. <laughs> 60 Minutes. Yeah. yeah 20, 24. <laughs> you're right. You're Jack right. Bauer on 24. On oh, 60 uh, Minutes. And, and <laughs> on 60 Minutes. Then every episode, you know that, that, that there's there's a bomb going to blow up, yeah. and he has to torture somebody, and he's willing to do that and, and break all the laws in order to save the life of the president or whatever he was trying to do. Uh, but how effective is this? I think I would agree that 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 one, uh, you know, that 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 uh, defying the rights of one person to save a thousand is very Machiavellian, but it's it. I, I can see where that could be could be philosophically a true statement. Mm-hmm. I understand that, but my, my favorite in, in that yeah. whole thing is unthinkable. If you haven't seen that movie, you need to go watch it. Don't even know what it is. Here, here's the problem I have. I'm, I've got some questions here uh, that th- these are not mine. I, I, I found these. Uh, first one is: Do we actually know that the suspect has the desired information? Right. Now, I'm going to put these out here and kind of talk our way around them and see where would you be? Would you be willing to torture somebody if you knew for a fact that they knew where where a bomb was? That there's a bomb in New York City. You know he knows where it is. Would it? Would, would you, as a person, be be willing to torture that person to get that? So let's start there. Yeah, you know he has it. There, there's there's another layer to this question to me. So if I knew. He knew where the bomb was, and all other options were exhausted. I say yes. And the reason I say that is not actually from a moralistic point of view. It's from repeated studies that have come out over and over saying torture is not effective. And once you burn the torture card, other methods become less effective. Yeah. Yeah. So with that caveat, like, we've done everything we know to do. The bomb... Yeah, you've told him you'll let him fucking walk. Yeah, and, and, and now we get to this thing, and we know that the bomb is going to go off tomorrow. And then there's the question of how do you know that? Maybe he told you that. Maybe he's just fucking with you, right? He wants you to violate your thing. But there's a point at which I would say, guys, I got a lot to say. But then I got to ask the question, too. You know there's a bomb. You know it's going to go off sometime in the next three days in New York City. Why not make an announcement and get people out of there? Yeah. You know? Okay. But... Well. but <laughs> you know. Because property damage is it, 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 isn't worth worth uh, torturing for, right? Well, but yeah, and 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 there's, there's a bomb in the Statue of Liberty, you know. But sorry, Statue of Liberty. Yeah, yeah and, and it's not even just property damage. It's the it, 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 that in its own is like this really defeatist thing of like, look, we know there's a bomb. We're getting everybody out of New York City. If you want to watch it go off, you're going to be in a hellhole the rest of your life. We'll rebuild the building. Nobody cares. Yeah. But then the, the thing that we often run into when, when we're dealing with practically is we don't know. Somebody kind of said there's a bomb. But then well, that, ha- that, that's the next step, though. Yeah. But, but I, anyway, at this point, we know. We know we there's know, a bomb. We know there's a bomb. We know he knows, knows where it is. Anna. Yeah. 
So um, I was actually going to cite some of the same things that John did about um, torture studies that have come out that have said torture isn't that effective um, and that it does decrease the effectiveness of other methods. So my first move would be to try to figure out which method is going to be the most effective at getting the information that we need. And that's the method that I'm going to start with. Okay. Yeah. If for... And I, I don't believe this would be the case in that situation, but if torture was, of all the methods available, the best method, while I think I would still consider it to be morally wrong, I think I would still do it. Yeah, yeah. this question to me kind of comes from the same place. That that, that question that, that we've all been asked at some point in our lives is like, would you bet your life or whatever you hold most valuable for a billion dollars? If yeah. you knew you couldn't lose, and you're like, wait, I know I can't lose. Like, I know, yeah, I can't. Well, that question well, yeah, doesn't make absolutely. sense. Absolutely, yeah, I can't lose. Yeah, but and then they say, well, what if you knew you can lose, but you're wrong? It's like, well, then I didn't, you know. What if you were ninety percent sure yeah, that you were going to lose? You get into all these weird things. That's a valid question. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, uh, I got to be honest. I think I, I would very quickly, uh, uh, I would, I, I would torture if I knew for. I'm assuming at that point that we've tried everything else. The bet now, you know you can't yeah. lose. Now right. I I have to. This guy this guy knows where it is. I'm going to save a thousand lives. I think the I think the uh, act utilitarian is, is, is correct in this instant. Uh, but but again, it, now we get to that, that that next part. What if you're reasonably sure that the person knows? You know, I'm reasonably sure. But instead of a, instead of it being a bomb in the Statue of Liberty. Let's put it in a real situation. Uh, you're a you're a U.S. Marine or a U.S. soldier, and you have captured one of Bin Laden's lieutenants in, mm -hmm. uh, in 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 Afghanistan. Bin Laden is still free. He's the guy that blew up. He's promising to blow up more stuff. Do you torture that person uh, because you have you're you're seventy five percent percent certain that this guy knows where Bin Laden is? Do you torture him? Do I torture him? So wait wait. You're 75% sure this guy knows where Bin Laden is. And, or are and, you going to torture him to get Bin Laden's But location? see, I have a utilitarian question about the, the what's going on with Bin Laden and, and all that. You know, because then you get into the question of preventing something bad from happening. And, and, and there's a difference to me in catching a bad guy and preventing an act of terrorism, right? Those yeah. are two different questions. So if the question you've is... Got a guy that's, you've got a guy that's blown up the coal, flown, flown bombs into... Uh, uh, World Trade Center. He's two major actions against the United States, and it's promised more, and he's still free. See, no, so, no, no. I, I don't do that. Now, if if he has specific knowledge of an act that's going to occur, or we know Bin Laden's doing something, I might get a little more fuzzy on it. But if you're just just straight talking about, it, he knows where this guy is. See, I, I, but I don't subscribe to the idea of like cut off the head of the snake and it dies. Like, yeah, well, that I, was the argument I was going to make. Yeah, like, well, we caught this one guy, and we saw how well that did. Yeah, we yeah. caught Bin Laden. We saw yeah. how beautifully that that ended terrorism in the world. You know. Yeah. So I no, think the world became safer after we caught him. But you know, but but I would agree, it doesn't end anything. Yeah. But it got rid of one guy, and we haven't had anything else blow up since then. Yeah, I mean, we haven't. This country hasn't. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't had anything blow up for years after he did the. Yeah, I mean, if you no, look, but at we had a we had a bunch in a row before that. We had the World Trade Center twice. We had the coal. We had the U.S. Embassy, and he took responsibility for three out of four of those. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. See, and, and I guess that the part of the difference is, you know, where you subscribe to the great man theory and taking down this great man. Did taking down Napoleon in the reign of terror, you know, if no, you had done it earlier? No, but taking down Bin Laden seems to have ended that happening. It hasn't happened since then. I mean, it's, no, I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, we, we've had pl plenty of people at least attempt. I mean, look, look, look at the uh, Boston Marathon bombing. That's true. Look that, at that's, the, that, 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 that's, that's, that's true. That's true. Uh, so somebody else fills the void. Yeah. 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 So to that end, no, I mean, to, to catch one guy now, if you start talking about he knows where Bin Laden is and Bin Laden is probably carrying a nuclear bomb into New York, that becomes a different situation. But if it's just we're going to catch Bin Laden, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't do it for that. Okay. I think even at 75%, um, I think there are most likely more effective methods. Okay. Uh, 
I, and I don't the know what I would have done. Beast thing. I would say that, 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 that I would say that before reading this, I would have done it. Okay. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what I would do at this point. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't think it's moral. I think it's immoral to do it. But I think the calculus there is you know the moral calculus is is on the side of of, of that. Uh, well, and to me, the, the, another thing to get into when you start talking about catching a guy versus preventing a specific act, that's where you start to get into that line of cruel and unusual punishment. Well, I, 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 I think, I think at a certain point, catching somebody is prevention. You know, uh, you, uh, you know, you, you don't, you don't wait till the disease happens to cure it. You, you, you prevent it before it happens. So I, I understand that logic too. So uh, yeah. I think there's a similarity there. All right, other other problems with it, and they're not really questions for us, but uh, you know, will a suspect simply tell the interrogator what they want to hear? Mm-hmm. We know today through uh, uh, statistics that that. You can torture somebody and make them say anything. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, that, that's the reason we don't do it in, in criminal proceedings, and and it's illegal. Is is we, say we know now. Forget that. We knew in the Salem witch trials you could torture yeah, somebody yeah. into. People will confess to being Satanists, and yeah, and pe- people in in Salem, Massachusetts, confess to dancing with the devil and kissing his ass literally uh, by firelight uh, yeah. under torture. Um, so, so yeah, wh- whatever your religion is, even if you somehow believe you can dance with the devil and kiss his ass, other religions confess things that are completely contradictory to the Christian religion. So whatever your religion is, somebody's been lying under torture. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And he- here's the other side. Let's talk about the slippery slope argument. What happens? Uh, what happens to to the United States uh, uh, in the global world if we start doing torture? Mm-hmm. Is there a slippery slope where the, where where uh, where other nations start violating the Geneva Convention because you know what if if the biggest guy on the block yeah, we the guy, shit if on the it. guy that wrote the now? Geneva Convention will violate it why shouldn't that you know it, it's funny and 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 I do think there's there's a validity to that but that is honestly the least of my worries the least of my worries is what the other countries are doing the the greatest of my worries is what we're okaying ourselves to do later. That's the next thing I want to yeah. do yeah. about the slippery slope. There's the slippery slope on international, but then there's the slippery slope in domestic affairs. If we're willing to use this in foreign affairs, what's to stop us from starting to use it in domestic affairs? Right. And sometimes those lines get really blurry. I mean, what we talked about in, in, in way previous episodes, the difference in a state and a country, mm-hmm. and, and this idea of the lone wolf terrorist, and... You know, if we talk about the practicality of where this debate has gone, we are no longer just talking about uh, foreign foreign uh, uh, prisoners of war. We are starting to talk about U.S. citizens and their connection to these organizations. And so I don't even think it's at this point in history. Now, I know we're talking from a high-level high philosophical place, but in history, in retrospect, we, we, we definitely... Kind we of violated that line. Their their civil liberties. Yeah. For suspected connections, um, how much further do we have to go to actually take the step of torturing them? Well, and and, and there's a lot of people. You know, I I, I put on our Twitter recently a, a quote. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the quote exactly, but it more or less said, "Philosophy uh, triumphs over future and past transgressions." Uh, with ease, but in present transgressions, uh, 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 philosophy fails. Or it's really bad at looking at what's going on right now. And there are large swaths of people who who are cheering this on, like, yeah, but they're terrorists. Fuck them. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, yeah. they're. But let's look at history, because past and, and future we're really good at, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's look at the internment of Japanese Americans, but but they they were part of the enemy, right? Nobody looks back at that and they yeah. were like, well, that was a great thing we yeah, did. Yeah, George Takei you know? was the enemy. Totally. Yeah. We, we got George Takei. At least he was locked up. I, you I, know. I, I've seen his acting. He, 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 might, he might be an enemy. I think oh, he's wonderful. I love George so Takei. Oh, he can't. I couldn't act his way out of a paper bag. Who gives a shit? He's very sweet. Oh, he's a good guy. But he can't fucking act. I will not argue that. I I would not I would argue, argue that, that anybody that, on that yeah, show I, could act. I was going to go the same way. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't love him for Star Trek. I love him for <coughs> Howard Stern. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. him for Twitter. All right. So oh, I, I love him for that, too. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Sorry. So Sorry. we talked about act utilitarianism. Yeah. The, 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 the next subsect is rule utilitarianism. Okay. And and it's, it's just a little bit different. While act utilitarians look for uh, the greater good in an action, 
Rule utilitarians will say that the greatest good is created by a law that, that leads to the best good of society. So instead of saying that, you know, killing this one person uh, will, will save a thousand lives, they would say, would violating this one law, uh, uh, would the greater good be, be, be to violate this law and make it, uh, make it uh, useless? Or would the greater good be to, uh, to, to defend this law and have something that, 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 that can be used over and over and over again? See, this is the reason I made the argument in the past of why I love my government to have a really utilitarian legislative branch and a really deontological executive branch. Executive branch needs to look at the laws and say, you know, what what can I do here? I have this constraint. But then I want the flexibility in the in the legislative branch to be able to say, let's make the laws to give them the, the space to work in to do what they need to do. And I think in some senses we have shifted from in the very beginning a very deontological all branches to a utilitarian all branches. And I think there's a place where you need that balance between two ideas. So, you know, back to your question of, is it okay to violate this law? I find that a very, a very hard scale to even imagine much less balance because what's the worth of one law versus one life? What's the worth of one law versus a hundred lives or a thousand lives? I don't even know how to start comparing those two in my and, mind. And, and that's tough. So I think that's why the, the rule utilitarian would say that torture is immoral uh, if it violates a law that already exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, 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 that's, that's something that, that I think is easier to understand. I think rule utilitarianism is easier to apply mm -hmm. yeah. than act utilitarianism. Uh, yeah, but then... Um a a rule utilitarian would agree that if a law is on the books stating that it is moral to torture or that it is legal, legal, legal to yeah. torture anybody suspected of a crime whether they are american citizens on american soil or anybody else in any other location they would view that as moral and I'm not a real utilitarian. I disagree with that. Okay. Interesting to me. Uh, th there was something that I came across when I was doing this. Uh, the moral justification for, for torture. Uh, and this, this was by a guy named Alan Dershowitz. Uh, if, if you've been around very long, he's a, he's a legal scholar, a constitutional scholar. Uh, but he was also a guy that um, kind of defended the... Patriot Act style stuff that was going on, but said that 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 we have to be willing to do this, but we also have to be we have to be very strict in how it's applied, and kind of turned on those people later on, in which you're not doing this right. Yeah, there's got to be rules in how we do it. Now, his example is is the one off circumstance. We can get we can get all bent up in this one off circumstance. Uh, you know, there's there's a bomb in a, there's a bomb in the Statue of Liberty. Well, this is a one-off situation. We're not going to make law for this one one situation because it, it, we're not going to have this situation again. We're just going to fix it. We're just going to go in and we're going to take care of it. It has to be done. Somebody has to fix this situation. But he said there's a way to do this. And this was fascinating to me. He said uh, he said that, that, that while torture should be something that is incredibly rare, he thought we should have torture warrants. Literally, where you could go and get a warrant to torture somebody. And here was his logic. He said, you have a right not to be tortured. But, and this is, this is a great to me intellectual, you have a right not to be tortured. You also have a right to privacy. You have a right to, uh, to, to, be, to be secure in your safe, your persons, and your people. You have a right not to have your phones tapped. In all of those cases, you can go to a court, you can present facts to that court and say, I, I need this information. And the court can give you a warrant for that instance. He said, well, your, your, your right to, to not be tortured is the same situation where if, but, but, but there has to be a check on it. He says, it can't be, you know, the president decided to do this or, or Bob in the field decided to do this. It's got to be, I'm going to go make my case to a court. The court is going to hear it. And um, the court is going to issue a warrant for this incident in this time. I thought it was a great logical argument, whether I philosophically I agree or not. It was it, 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 it makes sense to me logically. So that's interesting because I've actually seen 
a uh, the this applied similarly on the other end of it um based on the argument of even if you if you are being attacked by somebody and you kill them in the uh in the act of defending yourself you still assuming that the police department and yada yada um does the job they're supposed to be doing, you still have to answer to that in court. Yeah, there's a self-defense argument I want to get to, too, as we oh, go through oh, this. Oh, okay. So, but but, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and so the argument that I saw that I, I found interesting was, you know what? Um, we're not necessarily, like, torture is wrong, and but we're willing to say that if you can present a case after the fact that it was justified in this instance... Much like if you kill somebody in self-defense, you may get off on it, but you got to be really confident in, in what's going on. Of course, we've also seen the failures of the justice system there. So. Yeah. My, my issue with this is it reminds me of like the FISA courts. It reminds me of yeah. a situation mm -hmm. there where, we're, okay, we're going we're gonna, to uh, we're, we're uh, get rid of your, your civil rights, but we're going to do it through a court order so it's okay. But a uh, secret court. Yeah. But, it, but it, I like the argument here where he says... Uh, you know, this might be necessary in times in these one-off incidents. But do you want that maverick cop making that decision? Do you right. want? Uh, do you want a gunslinger? Do you want uh, one of this agency to make it, or do you want it to be brought where they have to present a case and a, a court is going to say yes, you can do this? Where there's where there's an, an an unbiased body, at least in theory. The downside of this is we know from history that the court almost always sides uh, with the, with government agencies against yeah. the rights of the people. Yeah, well, so you go from having a a uh, maverick cop to having a maverick judge who will sign whatever torture warrant comes across his desk, and rather than going to this one that maybe is on duty, you go to the torture the torture judge who's willing to sign your warrant no matter what. So, so my issue with... With all of this, and, and first of all, you know, I, I guess I need to say up front, I like that better than what we have right this moment. But my issue with this is when you talk about warrants, the, the founding fathers, and this is not a, a high praise of the founding fathers, this is a, you like it so much, go get a constitutional amendment for it, said specific places where warrants should be allowed, and the people, or at least the representatives of the people, agreed to that, right? So if you like this so much... Go get a constitutional amendment. It'll never pass. And you know that. Yeah. Because the people don't agree to it. So that's where I have the disagreement with this implementation. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is I have a much more persuasive system, let's say. Right? If you think torture is so super necessary, you're 100% sure there's a bomb in New York City. You know your superior said so and you just trust them implicitly. Go ahead and torture them. Torture him, and you'll go to jail. But you'll go to jail with the, the warm fuzzy inside that you stopped the deaths of thousands of people in New York City. And if the deaths of thousands of people in New York City is not, you're not A, confident enough in it, and it's not enough of a motivator for you to go ahead and do what you got to do to get the information, maybe you really need to question how confident you really were in the first place. And, and, well, and, and do you have faith in a jury system if you're... If you're Called up the, and do you the have jury? faith in the torture to get you the information? Because you're going to jail for this. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know. and that, that's actually, it kind of brings up something that I, I wanted to touch on here. And, and Mike, stop me if you're planning to discuss this later. But I kind of wanted to touch on the aspect of, okay, there is an act that is determined to be morally wrong, period, no matter what. And in this instance, we'll call it torture. I'm not saying we've made that decision. This is a hypothetical. If we, if the decision has been made that torture is uh, immoral no matter what, period. However, you can, through torture, in this instance, um, provide a result for the greater good. Is there, um, and and maybe I'm not even asking this question correctly. Is there an instance where that becomes okay, where the act is still immoral, but you are doing something that can be viewed as all right? And and I think 
just like with civil disobedience, part of that is accepting the consequences for the immoral act. Okay. I think I know the direction you're going, and mm -hmm. I want to get to it uh, uh, kind of in a back, in back door here through the okay. self-defense model, because okay. I think I think this is interesting to me, and it, it links to what both of you said. There, there, there are philosophers and historians out there that are argue that torture can already be seen as legal and no warrant is needed. And here is their logic behind it. It, they say that, that that torture can be understood as a self-defense power, okay? And their logic is, just as someone can kill in self-defense, if torture is, is used to prevent a definitive attack, you're acting in, in, in your own self-defense. And, and you don't need any other justification. You're doing this to, to, to defend yourself. That's the self-defense argument. And now, here, here's the thing. He says, but you've got to be willing to be arrested for that, mm -hmm. make your case before a court that, uh, you know, I, I did this in self-defense because he was going to blow my house up or he was going to blow the, he was going to kill me. So I am doing this in, in, in defense against an action. Mm -hmm. um, so torture in which you as the torturer are not in imminent danger is unacceptable. Well, that, 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 no, that, no, no, no. That, that, that's, that's not what he's saying at this point. That's going to be the rebut to it. Okay. But but he, he's saying at this point that if, if you're acting, you can already act in self-defense. I'm doing this to protect myself in a future action. Well, we, we, we've seen the heroes in the movies do this. You can't, you can't do that to him because, you know, it's illegal. And then finally some rogue cop who's the hero of the movie says, you know what, screw the law. And then goes in there, locks the door, and then he starts beating. He Batmans the Joker, you know? Yeah. And he, he goes off with him, and then he disappears. And But he saved, he saved Gotham, right? Yeah. But what happened at the end of that movie? They sick the dogs on him, right? Yeah. But I think that's a great self-defense argument for torture. I think I think that was the right way to torture the Joker, right? But at the end, he said, "Sick the dogs on me. I got to run away now. I've I've violated the law. I've I've done this." Now I know that the the dog action was was a little bit different. He was taking blame for Harvey's actions, but it doesn't matter. The point is, if you want to go through those channels. You've entered the realm of a rogue, and you need to accept the responsibility of a rogue. Yeah. Fact is, if Batman ever got arrested and put on jail, he or, or put on trial, he'd go to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Wider would go to jail today. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if 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 you act as a vigilante and act, act on your own accord, you're probably going to go to jail. It's not self defense, and that's the rebut to this. They they say that it's uh it's very elementary to consider this self defense because you're not actually acting in self defense. You're acting in defense of another. And the example that, that, that they give, they give, there's several here, but I love this one. They said, there's a lot of states that have castle doctrine laws. And under the castle doctrine, you have the right to defend your property. You have the right that if somebody, in Texas at least, you have the right that if somebody comes in this house, you can defend yourself by killing them. What you don't have the right to do is if you look across the street and somebody's breaking into your neighbor's house, you don't have the right to shoot him. Pull right. out a sniper rifle and say, I'm going to yeah. fix this, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's the comparison they make here. If you're using torture to stop a future action, it's not self-defense. Right. It's, in fact, uh, uh, pre-punishment. Well, and, and in that regard, torture can never be in self-defense because being capable of torturing somebody requires having control over them and their ability to stop you from torturing them. Yeah, uh, the, the, the philosophers that would argue against this would say that you don't need to torture this person to uh, to prevent the action. Locking them up would prevent the action. Or driving them 50 miles down the road and dumping them off in the middle of the woods and driving back so they can't get back. That would stop the action. You don't have to do, to do this torture. There are other actions that you have. The only time that, 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 that torture may be deemed uh, uh illegal is if there is no other action that could have met the same qualification and it just doesn't do that in this case um and i found that to be to be a pretty pretty uh compelling compelling argument there um so you, you know when you look at that uh kidnapping if somebody kidnaps your uh your, your child i don't know about you or me but if i could torture somebody to figure out where my kid was I would oh, yeah. do it. I would do it in a heartbeat. But the logical thing is, if you have the kidnapper, then 
your your child's not in danger. You you have them already. Yeah. Unless they're uh, an organization yeah. of kidnap. But yeah. yeah. But at that point, I say, yeah. Uh, you know, I. I, I oh, here's I, the deal. For my kid, morals go out the window. Yeah, I, I, I get to to go in front of a jury, as we've seen many yeah. other parents yeah. do, and say, yeah, I tortured him. You know, looking back now, I kind of wish I'd have tortured him a little more. <laughs> I, I stopped at some places where I might have gone through. I'm not sorry. Do you Y'all regret can, anything? Yes, I didn't kill him. Yeah. Y'all can decide if I should go to jail now. I didn't kill him, but, you know, his arm is never going to fit quite right anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You know, but, but that's the thing, right? If these agents really believe they're saving American lives, if these agents really believe what they're doing, that they think it's the only way to do it, cool. Say la vie. Yeah. And face the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the the last argument I, I I want to I want to put up here. This was an argument against it. Uh, the, it's called the moral argument against torture, and that's the historical argument that torture is most often linked with authoritarian regimes. If you as a nation accept torture as something, you are jo- are, are joining the the ranks of uh, of the North Vietnamese, mm-hmm. the Soviet Gulag, uh, Nazi death camps. Uh, South African apartheid camps. You're you are joining a yeah. an organization there, a group of people that that, that you probably don't want to be a part of. Uh, the other thing is that that in a liberal democracy, and, and I'm using the liberal classical liberal yeah, uh, yeah, here, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the United States, Canada, England, most Western countries are liberal democracy. Not the politicized liberal. Uh, yeah, uh, we just. We, we have largely made made it illegal to do these kind of actions, and, and we tend to frown on it. And if you want, if you doubt that we frown on it, look at how the nation responded responded when we uh, when we practiced it. Look at how we responded when we found out what was going on in Abu Ghraib. Look yeah. at how we responded when we found out what was going on in the Japanese internment camps or Gitmo. Uh, we know, we know philosophically that if you were willing to use torture. On uh, you know, on, on on a scale like the U.S. government has used, that ultimately uh, that's gonna that's gonna roll downhill, and police forces are gonna start using it, and uh, uh, you, know, you know, civil defense agencies are gonna start using it, and uh, you know, this is something that we've seen surprisingly high since 9/11. We are seeing the decay of human rights across the board. In places that, that 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 we didn't think we ever were, and I think it's because it it, it becomes it becomes acceptable. We become numb to it at yeah. a certain point. The, the, this is where I see the difference in the use of these tactics, and the leg- legitimization of these tactics, which is a totally different thing to me. <clears throat> Again, the 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 Batman went in and and tortured the Joker. That was a use. When the chief of police said, you know what, that, that re- worked really well. Guys, we're going to start doing that to all the criminals. That's a legitimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Um, I moved a lot on this. I, I'll kind of start our round, Robin, as we go through this because uh, uh, I found myself in a place that I found myself in a lot of shows where if you asked me, would you ha- would you use torture in, in this – if you asked me, would you use torture because – there's a bomb in New York and this person knows. I would say that I would absolutely do that. And that's probably why I shouldn't be the person making that decision. Uh, I, I found myself in a lot of those places around there where morally and philosophically, I believe it's wrong. And pragmatically and realistically, I know there are instances where I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's exactly why I wanted to ask that question earlier of, you know, is there an instance where it's okay I I expressed it myself earlier. Um, In the instance that my child's life is at stake, morals go out the window for me. I think think it's the wrong question. It it, it shouldn't be, is there an instance where it's okay? I don't think it's ever okay. But are there instances where where it's going to happen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I guess that's, that's kind of where I'm going. There are... I can identify a small set of instances for me where I don't give a shit about morals. I'm going to go and I'm going to get my son back and I'm going to do anything that I can to make sure that he's okay. And I don't give a shit if that means you lose your foot because I'm trying to find out where he is, you know? Yeah. 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 John. And and I don't like saying that. Yeah. It it puts you in a tough place because you're sitting here going, 
moralistically, I know it's wrong. Yeah, and I don't want to be an immoral person. I don't want to do immoral things. But I look at that situation and say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. I wouldn't hesitate in some situations. Yeah, so, I mean, if, if first of all, I, I, I guess one point that, that, that I want to make before we, you know, it seems like we're closing out. This whole conversation was kind of a scraping the surface of this argument. Oh, very much so. There's yeah. so much more. In fact, you know, arguments that we haven't addressed on what torture is, does yeah. spankings and household extended yeah, yeah, torture, yeah. you know, how much pain needs to be had. I even saw a really interesting argument where it defined defined torture as being uh, a, a, an aggressor was hurting somebody physically or mentally that person was uh, defenseless, and that that the intention was there. I, and I'm, I'm it had I'm, to have intent. Yeah, yeah, it had to have intent, and, and I'm chopping Otherwise, that up. It was just violence. And then there was this really interesting argument where somebody's being raped, um, yet because the 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 position they're in, the aggressor in that situation is is in a kind of a defenseless position. And the the victim here reached up and bites a chunk of their face out and just holds on till they let go, and he said, "Well, they were in some way defenseless," and and said, "But that doesn't really feel like torture to us." So that- well, and then an argument that I saw was that only physical torture is torture, and that yeah. mental and emotional. Uh, suffering and pain does not qualify as torture. They didn't grow up in my household. <laughs> so if it, m- m- my point is, if you really want to get into this, there's a whole lot yeah. more reading and research that needs to be done, and nothing that could be even covered in, in probably a three we show could do a series. series on this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'd rather not. It's kind of dark. To, to, to kind of the torture we've talked about more in this show, which has to do with uh, international Government. bodies yeah. torturing. People for gain, I mm-hmm. guess we, we can say. Um, I think that's probably the most uh, uh, egregious and dangerous form of torture that we, we can talk about uh, because it takes those in power. And we talked about this a lot in our privilege episode and the episode before, but it takes those in power and it takes the rare instance of their abuse that may be necessary. And we start talking about the legitimization of those rare instances. That's right. And that, to me, is probably... I mean, that's how head rolls. Heads yeah, yeah, roll. Yeah. If you listen to our last episode. I mean... You know, I, I, if you've been listening a while, you've heard these statements over and over again. But what I always come back to is that statement that, that, that John's made a few times. There's a difference between, you know, between rights and abilities. Yep. And I think when you're talking about torture... That's what it comes down to. to me, yeah. is, is, is is do I have a right to torture you? No, but in some instances, some instances, do I have the ability? Yeah, and will I exercise that ability? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in, in extreme cases, yeah. Uh, uh, fuck with my kids, and we, and, and, and we have an issue. But yeah. you're willing to answer for it, and that's it, key. Yeah, and I'll I'll stand at court, and uh, yeah, you know, yeah, that's how it goes. But don't convict me. I kind okay. of <laughs> yeah, I kind of find it interesting that we came to a similar place. Here, as we did on civil disobedience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I didn't. It's the, it's the evil side of it, right? Yeah. It's largely the same same argument. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I didn't expect, but I think if I had if I had thought about our civil disobedience episode while I was looking into this one, I think I probably would have realized it before then. Yeah. But it was interesting. I have found that with these shows, so many times, I really think I, I've got a grasp on these th- these things, and then I do these deep dives, and I really took a deep dive on this. This you is did. like this is just the surface. I was I was so deep into this stuff so, that I found myself. I would read one and go, "Oh no, he's right," and then we go, "Oh no, he's right." I questioned everything I yeah. I, I, I believe in this, and uh, uh, that that's an uncomfortable place to be. It yeah. is. It really is. Uh, however, I think everybody should be there at some point. You should oh, absolutely make yourself uncomfortable. Yeah, you know? it sucks. At the time, but it feels really good afterwards. Yeah, the, the, because now you can defend what you believe. You ever, you know why you believe it. It's yeah. not just because that's how what I've been exposed to. Yeah. Um, so, or at least, even at the very least, you know you've got more thinking to do about it. Yeah. And and this belief that maybe you held firmly to before, you realize 
you need to spend some time You've considering been conditioned it. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. 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 I mean, a, a whole, a, a large portion of philosophy has to do with really exploring, understanding, and putting yourself in the shoes of the dilemma. Mm-hmm. And dilemma means two Choices. bad yeah. options. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe it's three, maybe it's four, the trilemma, the, the quad lemma. But the point is, sometimes there aren't good options. Right. But in those instances, you don't get the magical fairy dust of saying, well, we're, since one of these options is a little bit better, we're just going to make it good for you. You just have bad choices. Yeah, to put that like layman's life. terms. Put that in layman's terms for you. Sometimes, sometimes there's just two fat, ugly girls that will go to prom with you. You're going to decide exactly. which one to go with. So you, know? so you go with both. <laughs> you go with you both. You go with both. Um, always go with you take you take one to prom and then you meet the other afterwards. I think in the the trolley problem uh, uh, context is called multi track drifting. <laughs> and it's, it's on the note of multi track drifting. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've enjoyed it and we hope you have too. You can find us on. Uh, oh yes, our producer is, is letting us know. We almost forgot the bit that we've started oh. this thing, this, this, this season. You're a good producer. Good yes, job. Yes, thank I don't you. what they say about you. Who's yes. next? I'm next. Oh, okay. I'm next. So, good, because I wasn't prepared. <laughs> so, we, uh, if you've enjoyed this podcast and you want to go listen to something else, uh, every week we're going to start recommending a podcast unless we decide this is a bad idea. But for now, we're, we're going to go with it for a little while. So, the podcast I want to recommend is actually not for most of our listeners. It's for their kids. It's a podcast called Pickle. And it takes ethical and philosophical questions and puts it in a way that kids can understand. And and then it, it's kind of intro to philosophy for kids. I subscribed to that after we talked about it last night, night before mm-hmm. last year. Uh-huh. You brought it up to me. And uh, I haven't listened to it yet, but it's, it's going to be my, my listen on the way to work probably Tuesday. Just yeah, they only have like six or eight episodes right now, so they're kind of new, mm-hmm. but they, they come from a, a syndicate of a much bigger thing, so it's well produced that they mm-hmm. have a, a team behind them, and, and they're already sounding good from day one. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I've i listened to them a little bit, and so far, I really like it. Yeah. Um, how does, uh, how does, y'all listen to it with, 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 with your, your kid, right? I listen he to- He was, I listen by myself. Yeah. So, so the very first episode, just kind of like a two minute introduction to the show. And then the next one is an episode on what does friendship mean? Yeah. And, and they kind of go through kids and they interview kids and, and who they think their friends are and have adults talking about their friends. And then, you know, you think, well, well, that's just a kid's show. They talk about Aristotle's three kinds of friendships and bring that full circle into this conversation my, of friends. My question is, uh, how, how did your how did your your child respond to that? I think he liked it. He listened to the first episode. Now he, I said, you want to listen to the next one? He was like, let's do one a day. I, I think you know he he, yeah. he he he. It wasn't as entertaining as maybe his video games or some other stuff is, but he liked it well enough to sit through a whole episode and seem to enjoy it well enough. Think it worked well in a car ride. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Right. yeah. Just kind of throwing this out there for yeah. our audience. Uh, give it a shot. Let us know what you think. So, yeah, about check that out too, Pickle. So. Yeah. 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 On that note, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you have enjoyed this uh, episode and, and have not didn't, found we're it torturous. Show up your house and torture you. That's yes. not true. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. Mike might. Yeah. We won't. They will. I won't. That's the point here. We will waterboard you. <sighs> Fucking hell. So, anyway, <laughs> find us on social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy. Um, hit up our website to get our beer ratings and things like that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to let us know what you think about this episode. Is torture right? Is it wrong? Have you tortured somebody? Have you been tortured and are willing to talk about it? Because I would understand if you're not. Oh, we'll do a whole show with you. Uh, sure, yeah. sure. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, and, and now, now, not not if it's just because you were in a bad relationship and your wife drove you crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, We've we all been there. Yeah, We've all been there, right? Yeah. So thank you. For like the fourth time for tuning in. We'll see you guys next week. Cheers. See you next week. Cheers. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 